Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Have your Bibles open at Revelation chapter 2, and we'll continue studying the seven churches we'll take up where we left off on the last broadcast. Direct us, Father, today, in Jesus' name, as we study, may thy will be done. For Jesus' sake, he's worthy. Amen. On the last broadcast, we finished up the discussion of the message to Pergamos. Now, let me review briefly, and I mean very briefly. To the angel there, we have the message, I know thy works, and you dwell where Satan's seat is. Then he goes on and he commends them, and then he says to them, I have a few things against thee. Uh, they had the doctrine of Balaam, and they allowed the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, we discussed that. We talked about the doctrine of Balaam, and then we talked about the Nicolaitans. They were mentioned earlier in the chapter. Then we hear the cry, Repent, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And we know, of course, that is the word of God, quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, all God needs do is speak the word. God does not need any atomic or hydrogen bombs. He does not need any guided missiles. He does not need any jet fighters or bombers. All God need do is speak the word. The Lord spoke and the earth melted, so the psalmist tells us. Now, when God speaks, that's all that is necessary, and judgment falls. Then, verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear. And, of course, we talked about that and talked about the white stone and the new name. Now, today, the message to Thyatira. Now, Dr. Schofield, in the chapter division, now, this is not inspired and doesn't claim to be. The notes and the divisions and the center references and the, the things that we have in the Schofield Bible that were put there by this great teacher and God did give him. God gave Dr. C.I. Schofield a great understanding of the Word of God, and he was a great scholar. The Schofield Bible is a King James Version. Many have written to me, and they've said, Brother Green, what version is the Schofield? Now, many think because it has the name Schofield Bible that it's a Schofield translation, but that's not true. It has notes and chapter divisions. For instance, you who have a Schofield Bible, you see that each church, that is, at the beginning of the message of each church, we have a division, and we read there in his notes what we're going to study in the next verses. And that helps, especially a young Christian. So this period ran from about 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D. Now, let me say this again. I've said it many times, but you just keep this in mind. Whereas most of you know everything that I'm saying. Most of you know everything I've said during the study, but there are many who do not. So we are, we are studying Revelation for the benefit of all, but primarily young Christians and those who've never had the opportunity to study it verse by verse. Now I'm saying again, the message to these seven churches, the message was directed to each church that had the name that's given here in Asia Minor. There, there were seven churches by the names given here, and there were other churches, not only seven, but there were others, and this message was to that local church, but it goes beyond the local church, and in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, we have the history of the church from Pentecost to the rapture in advance. God writes history in advance. Man writes it after it occurs. But the Bible is just as up to date as the next history book. 
The Bible is just as up to date as tomorrow morning's headlines. The Bible is just as up to date as tomorrow morning's sunrise. Now you remember that. Don't you ever forget that God writes history in advance. And everything the Bible prophesies has occurred or is occurring or will occur as declared. Now the message to Thyatira. Under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Now we know who that is. Jesus, the head of the church. Who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire. We read about that in chapter 1. His eyes like a flame of fire, feet like unto fine brass. We read that back in chapter 1. I know thy works. Every church, I know thy works. I know thy works. Yes, God knows your work. God knows my work. He knows all about you. I know thy works. And I know your charity and service and faith and patience and works and the last to be more than the first. Now, they were a working people. Now, I believe in good works, and we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and faith without works is dead. Now, living faith produces works. We do not all work the same works. We do not, we all of us do not the same amount of work. Some do greater works than others, but if you do what God calls you to do in the eyes of God, your work is just as great as mine. My work is just as great as yours. I may preach on many radio stations. You may preach on one or two. I may preach on many radio stations. You may pastor a little rural church. But if you give your best and I give my best, your work is just as great as mine. My work is as great as yours. I mean, beloved, God does not measure by man's yardstick. We say he's a great preacher. He has a great church. He may. He may. Yes, he may. There is a possibility that he doesn't have a great church in the eyes of God. It may be big, and that's wonderful. It may have a great number of members, and that's wonderful. And it may bring in a lot of money, and it takes money to run the church, yes. But a great church in the eyes of God is a church that is following the footsteps of Jesus and rescuing souls from an eternal hell, getting people saved and sending the gospel to those who never heard. That's a great church in the eyes of God. And I said, I know your works. I know your works and service and faith and patience and the works The last is greater than the first, notwithstanding. Now, listen, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach, and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, I see. Now listen, beloved, listen. In the world, believers will have tribulation. But when you read your Bible, beloved, when you read your Bible, and when you study your Bible, be very careful to see every word. Tribulation, great tribulation, the great tribulation. Tribulation such as was not until this time. You find all that in the Bible. Now, we are reading here about great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death, and uh, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now, let me stop just a moment here. We know what Jezebel stands for in the Bible. Now, we've read about Balaam, we've read about the Nicolaitans, and a little bit later... We're going to read about Jews over here in another, well, it's over here in the, uh, uh, on the, in the next chapter. Uh, They call themselves Jews and they're not and so forth. And so we read about these different groups and different, uh, classes and, uh, we need to see what each one represents and what each one stands for. Now, we find here, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee. 
Now, he said, you sufferest that one of the things, now this is one, this is not all, but you allow, that's what the word suffer means, you allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, you can, you can interpret that as literal fornication if you desire, and I certainly agree that it could possibly mean literal fornication, but I believe it goes deeper, and I believe it's even more serious to commit spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery, than it is to commit literal or physical fornication and adultery. In other words, I believe that it is more dangerous and severe, and I believe it is more deadly to be a spiritual fornicator than a physical fornicator. Now, the Bible speaks of eyes full of adultery. And James tells us that to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy to God. And then he goes on to say, these people that are worldly and love the world and they're friends to the world and participate in the world and they uh, they uh, mix and mingle and fellowship in the things of the world, he says they are spirit. They are committing spiritual adultery. Now I say again, they. You can say here that it is speaking of literal fornication. The prophets committing fornication literally, but I believe it goes deeper. Even though they may, some may have been guilty of committing fornication, I believe he is speaking in the deeper sense of spiritual fornication. Now, let me show you, let me tell you why I believe that. I have a few things against thee because I'll teach that, the suffers that woman Jezebel teach. Now, here's what he said, and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, comma, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, uh, that, uh, of course, idolatry and being a friend to idolaters is certainly spiritual fornication and spiritual adultery. Now, let me say this, and I know that I am on dangerous ground when I begin speaking about women and their place in the church. Now, let me say this. I think this is a good place for me to make something clear. We get many letters, many letters from dear people in Radio Land, and they ask us to help them settle a church difference. Now listen, I'm not a compromiser. And if something comes up in my church, where I belong, where I live, where I attend, and I know the circumstances, I'll take a stand. If everybody in the church turns against me, I'll take a stand. But beloved, when someone writes me 2,000 miles, and they do from Greenville, South Carolina, 500 miles, 200 miles, or even 100 miles, or even 50 miles, and I know nothing of the situation, I've never been in the community, I do not know the pastor, I do not know the precious people, then you are just a little bit unfair to ask me to help you settle a church dispute about things that are not pertaining to the cardinal truths of Christianity and the fundamentals of faith. Now, you say, Brother Green, my preacher preaches against the virgin birth. What do you think? It won't take me a half a minute to tell you what I know. You should get out of that church, and I mean get out now. You say, Brother Green, my preacher doesn't believe in the shed blood as the only remission of sin. My preacher says that you can be saved apart from the blood. What should I do? What do you think about it? It don't take me 30 seconds to tell you what to think about it. I'll tell you to get out of that church and get out quick. Don't go back. Write, call. Don't even ask for a letter. Just write them or call them, tell them to drop your name. You don't want a letter. You don't want a letter from a church like that. What do you want a letter from a church where they don't believe in the blood? Bless your soul. But now, wait a minute, wait a minute now. You write me a letter, and you say, Dear Brother Green, there is a girl singing in our choir, and we feel that she does not dress as becoming a Christian. Don't you think our pastor should forbid her singing in the choir? Well, now, you see, I write you a letter, and I say, Certainly get her out of there. Now, I don't know a thing about that girl. 
She may be dressing indecently. She may be just a babe in Christ. Here's the whole thing. If the choir director and the pastor are spiritual, they will handle the thing without any outside help. And if they're not spiritual, they'll resent anything I say and be more determined to keep her in the choir and put some more in their lacquer. Now, I'll take a stand with anybody, anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances when it comes to the cardinal truths of the Bible and Bible doctrine. But I can't, I cannot. Help settle your church differences when it has to do with people singing in the choir or other things that has to do with individuals and your pastor. After all, you called him to be your pastor, and if he's not what he should be, don't ask me to tell you to get rid of him. If you're the kind of a Christian that you ought to be, you won't need to ask me. You'll get rid of him without asking anyone because the Holy Spirit will lead you. So I hope you understand what I mean. Many times we must write precious people and say we cannot afford to take issue with a pastor when we know nothing about the circumstances, when we have not been there, we've never been in the church, we don't know the community, we do not know the surrounding and, and the different things. Now, I want you to know, God bless you, I'm not a compromiser. When it comes to the blood, the virgin birth, the verbal inspiration, when it comes to the cardinal truths of Christianity, I'll tell you right quick where I stand, and I'll tell you right quick, if a minister doesn't preach the cardinal truths and the fundamentals of the faith, you've got no business in his church and you shouldn't be you shouldn't need to be told by me or anyone else to get out you should be big enough and have christianity enough to get out without being told now i hope you understand i hope you understand now at thyatira they let jezebel stay in there now of course it wasn't the literal jezebel that was back there, and Jehu threw out the window, and the horses and chariots trampled her until they didn't find anything but the palms of her hand and the soles, palms of her hands and the soles of her feet. It wasn't that literal Jezebel, but the spirit of Jezebel, and it was fornication and idolatry. And we have a lot of spiritual fornication today for a believer to be a friend of the world. For a believer to be a friend to the enemies of Jesus Christ is to commit spiritual fornication. And of course, to partake in idolatry in any form, to partake of idolatry, or to support or sanction idolatrous, that is, any worship that is not directed fully and entirely to Jesus Christ, that's wrong and you'll pay for it. Now ask yourself the question, what kind of a church am I in, and what kind of a minister am I supporting? Father, honor the word, the name of Jesus, the shed blood, and save souls, and help believers to support a man, and a church that stands up for the truth, and the truth alone. In Jesus' name, he's worthy. Amen.